Welcome to Slash Forward. Hey, who doesn't like a well-executed, good-natured prank? Exactly, we all do. But what about pranks with real-world consequences, risk, or an element of danger? Is it ethical to draw unknowing parties into jokey situations that may result in their untimely death? It seems like a hard no, but a strong case for the opposite is made in the film April Fool's Day. We will explore this moral quandary, beginning with a brief recap of the movie so we're all starting from a shared basis. Points. Let's get to it. We open on some camcorder exposition, in which young Nikki here explains they're taking a ferry to their friend Muffy St. John's Island for spring break. She takes a few moments to introduce herself. My parents are my best friends. Oh, and I, I start convent school next semester. <laughs> Loser. And I fuck on the first day. Oh my goodness! Then the lewd boys, Arch and Skip, jump in and tell us nothing we couldn't already guess about them. Meanwhile, Muffy is preparing for what must be an interesting sort of themed party, based on the decor she chooses. She pauses momentarily to get herself wrapped up in the whimsy and titillation of that most classic of all children's birthday gifts. If you were born in 1940, through this memory it's also revealed that her daddy was a dick. Back at the dock, as the ferry rolls in, the gang of familiars is joined by Nan, short for shenanigans, who was invited to this intensive party situation as a casual acquaintance of Muffy. As Kit and Arch help her, she ingratiates herself to no one with her wholesome cottagecore demeanor. The ferry then floats up and gives the dock a little love tap, and we find the ferryman to be very serious about his schedule. Chaz casually goofs his way onto the deck as Rob and Hal rush in at the last minute. This awkward mix of family and friends now has to occupy themselves for the overwater trip, so Skip pulls out his blade for some high-risk games. It's only a 15-minute trip, but Nikki is vitamin D deficient, so she strips down and lays out, liking what he sees a great deal. Hal saunters up and attempts to woo her with the sweet sounds of finance talk. But you're not even in crypto, bro. They all get pretty bored and complacent pretty quickly. Sniffing each other, lassoing, knifing around, it's all calm and serene until the testosterone basically bursts out of their glands. Arch gives Skip his knife back in an aggressive way, blade first and airborne, which is not ideal. When a couple of the boys jump in to save them, the wool is lifted from their eyes and the perpetrators cannot believe how delighted they are in this successful tomfoolery. Buck decides, since he's already in the drink, to tie them up from under the boat, you know, for efficiency. But when the ferryman again comes in to kiss the dock, Buck gets smeared against the sturdy wooden posts. He surfaces with his face absolutely shredded and is quickly tossed into the constable's vessel so they can motorboat his ass back to the mainland. Constable Potter needs to borrow a boat now, so Muffy directs him to the keyboard in her kitchen, and he warns them to stick around for questioning later. This leads to a fairly low-energy drive, which is not what you want to start your spring break. But they perk up when they see their lodging. As they're welcomed in, we learn that Muffy will actually own the joint when her inheritance kicks in next month. And if there's one thing college kids get stoked about, it's dope personalized place settings in a formal dining area. Given the late hour, the ladies waste no time warming up the pork and beans and chopping up the coleslaw. While the others carry the load, Nikki entertains them with a sex quiz that is delightfully randy. Anal entry. In a VHS interlude, Arch confides that his main goal is to bed as many ladies as he can manage, but he is somewhat selective, which is contradictory. Hal lurks around, soaking it all in, imagining what it'll be like when he's a wealthy dickhead. And as the sun sets on the calm island, Skip laments the rich boy's obligation to always fulfill the wishes of the father, so as to keep his pockets flush with cash. Then they all pull up for dinner, say a little prayer, and enjoy some fine prankery. As if the pranks weren't enough, they also partake in public humiliations, as it's revealed that Rob passed his med school exam, but was advised against attending due to being viewed as a puerile man-child. Nan tries to lighten things up with a toast to new friendships, which is presumptuous. Then, by demand, Muffy stifles her giggles and gives her own toast, hitting them with that deep stuff and making Nan's sentiments look like a bucket of crap. Then these losers get drool cupped. As they all find their rooms, the boys are bunking together, and they make the most of it with a little bed top rib tickle. Nikki asks the muster to respectfully allow her to take the first crack at Chaz, having already rejected Hal, who happens to be practicing his mode of seducing Muffy as they speak. As he checks his space, he finds various articles placed about the room dealing with mysterious deaths and fires. And they all learn, little by little, that this whole place has been fully rigged up for folly, and fully stocked up with party materials. 
It really is relentless, and some may say a bit too much, bordering on interfering with their enjoyment of the moment. For instance, Nan can't even enjoy a hot steamer without being assaulted by someone's mixtape of mysterious baby noises. At bedtime, Rob and Kit are still working through the dinner embarrassment, and subsequent embarrassment brought on by their choice of underpants, but they do find some relief from the room's trick wiring, which takes their minds off things and only represents a minor fire hazard. On Muffy's way to her room, Arch jumps out of what must be some sort of secret hallway compartment, apparently, and attempts a seduction via childlike playfulness. This entices her to retire more quickly than before, so he begins creeping around looking for a new challenge. When all else fails, he finds that even the ladies of his boudoir periodical reject his advances. Outside, Skip is proper drunk, dealing with the guilt of Buck's injury. Not even some fresh fronds of witch hazel cheer him up, so he willingly heads down to the boathouse to explore, but finds himself suspicious expecting every creek to be an assailant, and one of them is. The next morning, they walk in on Muffy making eggs, which disorients her and causes her to run off in a huff, claiming that she forgot to get dressed. Outside, while balling, the boys casually wonder where Skip got off to, while also aggressively attempting to cup Chaz's taint. On the sidelines, Nan sees Muffy making her way to the garden shack and attempts to have a word with her, unsuccessfully. Out at the water, Rob is still too introspective to have fun, a sign that he is a fairly serious lad. So just give med school a shot, bro. Kit, however, knows the one thing that'll cheer up her man, taking his virginity in the boathouse. But when she takes a moment to scope out the deck slats, Skip's waterlogged corpse drains her sexual energy. They rush back to sort out if this was some sort of sick prank, but no one's seen Skip all day. They all run back down to try to find him, but only come up with a fractured bloody knife. Suspecting the ferryman to be exacting his revenge, Arch commits to finding him or Skip, and then helping or hurting who he finds, depending on which one. Meanwhile, Muffy is taken to acting like a meek little weirdo, and is finally confronted by Nan, who is upset about the baby tape. As it turns out, there are deeper implications for her, indicating that someone may be messing with her mind. Out in the woods, and despite his best efforts, Arch only finds the sounds of cracking branches. They're coming from all around, keeping him in the vicinity of an ankle snare and an angry snake, all of which lead to an unexpected confrontation. The boys return to the house to discover that they're down one more body. Kit insists on calling the police. Muffy is surprisingly chill about everything, because uh, the phone's not working, so why worry yourself about it? Not to pile on the tragedy, but then they can't easily make some relaxation tea due to a break in the water main. Nikki and Hal go out to procure water water from the well, and while doing so, because I would really like to plow your field. Hal lays it all out there, but he can't even keep the bucket on the line, and then isn't brave enough to venture down the ladder. Unfortunately, she tosses a rung, flinging her into the water. This is mostly fine except for the body parts floating around, which now include all of Nan's parts. Thankfully, Hal is able to reach down from a stable rung and eventually grab and pull her out. They recuperate and wonder what to do about the mad ferryman tormenting them. As if on cue, the constable calls to check in. He confirms that he's with the guys right now, so they actually have an unknown entity to contend with. Her recommendation, they just have to stick together until he arrives with a rescue boat and sends up a flare. They take measures to secure the premise and spread some light around. Kit takes a moment to observe an old family photo, but the now austere Muffy insists that she respect her father's den by getting out of it. The trip could take Potter all night. So, as they settle, we learn that Hal likes to stay strapped, especially when on vacation. The waiting does little more than raise tensions. When the conversation turns to Muffy's odd behavior, Hal notes the content of her prior argument with Nan. They then learn that some of them have found strange secret items in their rooms that may have personal significance as well. But the casting of these aspersions is beyond the pale for Kit, who's all about friendship and loyalty. But Muffy doesn't do much to instill trust, creeping around the way she does and refusing to stay grouped up. With her breaking the ice, they all decide to split up, but do agree to stay within shouting distance of one another. Nikki summons Chaz to her quarters, but spends their time together packing up all her shit. Chaz wants her to stay with the group for safety and attempts to put his foot down. However, he is incapable of either convincing her or turning her on. When she returns from a brief absence, it looks like he's on the bed holding his crank, but she takes a peek to find no crank present, and all without a sound. Kit and Rob venture to the attic, hoping for a better vantage point to see the constable. Here, Rob reveals that Potter told him to trust no one, especially Muffy. Primo info to share after everyone went their separate ways. Then Kit adds to the lore by finding evidence that Muffy's been up here and is recreating various scenes of murder with her Barbies. 
Luckily, the flare flares up at that moment. Rob heads to the main level while Kid explores the rooms looking for Nikki, with the pranks taking on a newly ominous and foreboding tone. Rob circles back to confirm they're now the only two around, and they get confirmation on the fate of the rest as they frantically flee from this house of horrors. When they get to the dock, the constable's boat is there, but there's no constable. Also, he took his keys, so they can't ditch him. They do find a warning that Potter received indicating a Miss St. John has recently escaped after a three-year stint in a psych ward, but Muffy's been at Vassar with them that whole time. With no other options, they realize they have to get to the keyboard in the kitchen, but they return to a dark house with all the doors now closed. Just to play it safe, they enter through a basement window, but any designs towards safety are dashed when they find a robust blood trail leading to the furnace, which contains Muffy's original clothes. So now they know they're looking for a naked Muffy, except they find wall evidence that, along with the office photo, allows Kit to sort out that Muffy has has a twin sister, but the painting is here now, with eyes, from Muffy's head. Buffy then nails them in and watches from outside. Rob makes a play for the boat keys, but gets latched into the pantry. This happens right as Buffy finds her way in, leaving Kit to be slowly walked down with a giant fillet knife. Unable to escape, she resigns herself to her fate and accepts death, but then decides against it. She bursts into the study where everyone appears to be trapped in limbo. Talking silently and pretending not to exist, until the trick is revealed. While they delight in the ruse, Rob is having a moment of severe existential crisis with Buck in the pantry. He seems somewhat impervious to the signs indicating that things are going to be okay, until he receives an official notice of congratulations from Muffy for having solved the mystery. As it turns out, she was testing a concept for a weekend murder mystery bed and breakfast, a business idea she came up with to help cover the estate's incredibly hefty tax bill. The whole gang was tricked, only learning what was happening after being killed off. Only her brother Skip was in on it, along with Buck the makeup specialist, her uncle who played the constable, and the actual ferryman, who did a great job. Thanks to the rousing success, they popped the champ and party like college students on spring break. Except for Nan, who seems to have a stick up there. Muffy returns to her room tired, moist, and totally blasted. She finds a mysterious present on her bed. Familiar with the concept, she jacks that box until it pops. And it's revealed that Nan is using this to teach a lesson about the ethics of pranking. Wink. So just to provide crystal clear clarification, Muffy comes from a wealthy family. Her mother died when she was younger. Her dad was going to sell the house unless she demonstrated she could manage the property. She had an inheritance that was set up to initiate when she reached a certain age. Since she was a month from her birthday, that means she was a month from inheriting the estate. Of course, a regular old college kid can't afford the upkeep, taxes, or utilities on an island mansion. When the water main broke, spitting out brackish water, she knew exactly what happened because it was a regular thing they had to deal with. That's no cheap repair. In addition, she seemed to have some sort of minimal housing staff on payroll as well, since apparently her inheritance didn't include any sort of cash, treasury bonds, or even a money market account. She was left trying to figure out how to cover these costs to keep the house rather than let it go into disrepair or put it up for sale. Her big idea was to do a type of murder mystery dinner, but over the course of a whole weekend. Also, if you get caught by the killer, you have to spend the rest of your relaxation time in the garden shack so everyone thinks you're dead. Although she did say that paying customers would know what they were signing up for and wouldn't be in quite so extreme of a situation. It's not clear why her group of friends couldn't know, but the spontaneity of it all definitely helped work out some of the kinks. For instance, if you allow the game to expand outside the grounds of the home itself, you do risk unforeseen injury like a snake bite or worse. Now she knows that she's going to need to carry the proper bonding and insurance to cover these risks, and would likely benefit from a $10 million umbrella policy as well. You really can't underestimate the importance of these things. It was also somewhat glossed over, but Buck the makeup guy had a variety of props and gags ready to go from prior jobs he had done. Movies, plays, haunted houses, etc. He just redressed some of them to look like the guests so he could pull off the effect. This doesn't address how they got Nan to go floating around in the well. It also means they convinced Chaz pretty quickly to play along with the gag. However, he was established early on to be somewhat of a merry jokester, so that may not have been difficult. There are some other questions that are not so easily addressed. The car accident news clippings and the baby noises were coincidentally specific to Hal and Nan. They were intended to just be general props to add to the mystery, although it's not clear how, since none of them were used as evidence to solve the actual mystery that unfolded. But then, how did Nan know about the significance of the jack-in-the-box? Was that also just just a strange coincidence? 
not really a big deal, nor are any of the other contrivances or odd stretches. Yeah, if you think about the background work that went into pulling this all off, it's a bit of a stretch. And also, they tried to address it at the end by waving their hands over it. For instance, Skip was presented as Muffy's cousin, but he was actually her brother, because they didn't want them to know how close their ties were. But then, why did he need to be attacked in the boathouse, or any of them be falsely abducted when out of view of the others? But ultimately, it is inconsequential, because no one ever actually dies, and the overall mood and themes they're trying to convey are executed well, leaving you with an overall positive experience. In addition to that, this movie revels in its characters. Everyone says their names in an introductory way multiple times throughout the movie. I like a movie that believes in its characters and really thinks we need to know them all. This leads to memorable little beats that really define their various personalities. Reading up on the movie, the director made a point of allowing the actors to make stuff up and do what came naturally to them, and I think it worked. You also have to appreciate the prank tears in this. If you were a kid who appreciated gag trinkets, you'll recognize that this was some next level shit. Rather than cheap hand buzzers that require 40 pounds of pressure to set off or any of the other cheap standards, they have actual cigars that really really blast off in your face. Additionally, traps and pranks that actually require some materials and engineering to pull off. It's the kind of stuff you wished you could do when you were a kid, except you weren't allowed to mess up the furniture and you didn't have any resources, so you were relegated to just greasing the doorknobs on April 1st. A mediocre prank that's mostly just annoying and requires you to clean up afterward. That is D tier at best. For the most part, you don't really have to do anything, but in this case, you have to respect a mid 80s slasher that was willing to go outside the lines and try to put together something unique and memorable that could stand alone as a generally good movie by its own merits. For that reason, it's a must-see to round out your knowledge of the slasher genre. It's also a great time capsule for observing the unusual behavior of your ancestors. When these college folks hang out and mess around, the behavior feels foreign in comparison to how we're used to seeing things portrayed in modern movies. Outside of being a good slasher and an interesting movie, it's not actually scary, and due to the nature of the plot, it's essentially goreless. So if that's what you're into, it's not going to blow your mind. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.